This is a screencast about some notes on force and motion for the class Physics 106, Physical Science for Educators. Um, I decided that I wanted to save a little bit of time during class this week by doing some of the notes as a screencast instead. Um, so what I would recommend is first find the page in your workbook that corresponds to these notes. Um, starts on page 83, and if you want to refer to the lecture notes, some, most of this is also around page 110 or 111 in your workbook. So the definition of what a force is, it's typically thought of as a push or pull on an object. And so when we show a push, um, usually we'll show the arrow acting on the object. If it's a pull, um, it's directed away from the object. But the direction of forces is important. Um, the way that force is measured in terms of units is as a Newton which is a kilogram meter per second squared. So we'll see with Newton's second law, we can write a net force as a mass times acceleration. So those are the units of mass in kilograms times acceleration in meters per second squared. And I would say if you need time to write something down, just pause the video and do that. All right, so uh, we talked about this on the first day of the unit when we were eliciting ideas on our posters about force and motion. Um, but Newton's first law is typically stated as an object in motion will stay in motion and an object at rest will stay at rest unless it's acted on by an outside force. And we have an, a, another term which is called inertia, which typically refers to the property of an object to resist a change in its motion. So something that has a really high mass is hard to move. That we would say is an object that has a lot of inertia. And I think in the lecture notes there's a picture of somebody trying to push on a, a boulder. Um, if you have a really big object, it's going to have a lot of inertia. And we'll also be playing in class with some bowling balls and trying to hit them with a croquet mallet. Um, bowling balls, you'll see, it is pretty hard to change their motion as well. Newton's second law, um, this is the one that people may or may not have heard of before. And it's kind of a lengthy statement, but it states that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it, is in the same direction as that net force, and is inversely proportional to the mass. So it's typically written either as acceleration is equal to net force over mass, or as F, the sum of the forces on an object, is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so this picture is meant to kind of help explain what that means. Um, if you have a force acting on a small mass, um, what that means is that that force will cause it to have a really big change in its motion or a big acceleration. Whereas if that same force is acting on a big mass, um, you can see from the equation, a larger denominator will make a smaller value for the acceleration. So um, if that same force is exerted on a big mass, you won't see as much of a change in, in its motion or a smaller acceleration. Um, so that's another statement of Newton's second law. And Newton's third law um, states that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, but what this really means is that for every force that's exerted there is some pair force, uh, some equal and opposite force that goes along with that force. And these pictures show a couple of examples. In this case, the car, um, you know, has some motion because there's, you know, forces being exerted. So a tire pushing on the road and then the road pushing on the tire. So if you're trying to identify pair forces, usually you, you're going to look for the same two words. Here we have tire and road and road and tire. Um, if there's a rocket pushing on some gas and then the gas is pushing on the rocket man pulling on a spring and the spring pulling on the man. And I think the one that people sometimes get confused about is when we think about gravity and the earth pulling down on objects. So if there's the earth pulling down on this ball that's falling, the pair force or reaction force is that the ball is pulling back up on the earth. Um, the earth doesn't really experience experience much change in its motion because it has such a big mass. So it's not really a noticeable force that the ball is, ball is pulling back up on the earth, but um, that is the correct pair force. All right, so when we're going to uh, depict forces acting on an object, we'll usually draw an arrow. And the length of the arrow or the size of the arrow means indicates how strong that force is. So on an object, 
you know, if we are going to draw like three forces acting to the three newtons of force acting to the right on this block and three newtons of force acting to the left, the size of those arrows should be the same. Um, on this one you can see we have three newtons acting to the right and five newtons of force acting to the left. So that one is a little bit bigger arrow than the one acting to the right. And so when we want to add up how much total force is acting on that object, we'll typically treat the ones going to the right as positive and the ones going to the left as negative. And then we'll just add them up. Um, so if you take the negative three newtons to the left and add the three newtons to the right, you'll see that we get zero newtons acting on this block. And so if we wanted to draw a picture of just the net force or total force acting on that object, we wouldn't draw any arrows because it's just a net force of zero. And we'll see later on that that's called a balanced force on it. All the forces cancel each other out or are balanced. Whereas on this block, um, you'll see that we'll have five newtons to the left and three to the right. So we're left with two newtons acting to the left or a negative two newtons. And so the way we draw that is we look at the size of these arrows and we look at whatever's left over when you subtract this one. Um, so kind of looking at the size of this arrow and the size of this arrow, what's left over is two newtons acting to the left. So you want to make that arrow a little bit smaller than this one to indicate that it's two newtons. And that would be the net force acting on that block. Suppose we know the mass of that block that we just looked at and we say it's one kilogram. What would be the acceleration from Newton's second law? So we already found the net force was acting to the left and it was a negative two newtons. So that's the net force acting on that block. If we know the net force, we can use the equation for acceleration is net force divided by the mass and we can get negative two newtons divided by the kilogram gives us an acceleration of negative two meters per second squared, meters per second per second. But what does that mean about the motion of that block? So if you wanted to describe the motion of the block in words, um, you would have to know that the, since it's accelerating in the left direction, that means that it has a change in its motion. It's increasing its speed towards the left. Um, so in this case, if the block was initially at rest, we would say that it's moving to the left with increasing speed as a result of that net force acting towards the left. Um, so when we talk about unbalanced forces versus balanced forces, um, we're going to say that unbalanced or net forces as a result of Newton's second law are going to result in acceleration. What this means is that if the object isn't initially moving, if it's initially at rest, it'll start moving in that same direction as the unbalanced force with increasing speed. So if the unbalanced force is to the left, it'll increase its speed to the left. If the unbalanced force is to the right, it'll increase its speed to the right or whatever direction that unbalanced force is in. If the object is initially moving, it's a little bit more complicated. So if the object is initially, say, moving to the right in this case, um, the fo unbalanced force is working against that motion, so it's going to cause it to slow down instead of speed up. So it, initially, if it's moving to the right and there's an unbalanced force, it will slow down, come to a stop, and then it'll reverse its direction and start moving to the left with increasing speed. Um, if you want a real-world example of what, of what this might look like, you can think about gravity. If you throw a ball up in the air, Gravity is always acting to pull that ball back down towards the Earth. So if it's initially moving upward, the unbalanced force is in the opposite direction of its motion. So the ball is going to go up and up. It's going to gradually slow down until it comes to a stop at the top of its path. And then it's going to reverse and come back down towards the Earth with increasing speed. So it's going to speed up more and more as it gets closer to the surface of the Earth. Um, so when the motion is opposite to the unbalanced or net force, the object will decrease its speed. If the uh, motion of the object is in the same direction as the unbalanced force, it'll speed up in that direction. So with balanced forces, you could have no motion or if the, um, you could have constant velocity of motion as well. So if the object isn't moving, initially maybe it's just resting there and there are two forces acting on it that are balanced, 
it will just maintain its motion. It'll remain stationary. If the object is moving and there are balanced forces on it, so think about uh, maybe an object is, is moving already, uh, maybe you're pushing on something against friction, then if the forces are balanced it'll continue to move with a constant speed. So it won't speed up or slow down, there's no acceleration. So it'll maintain its motion. So some examples of forces are also in your um, workbook. We've already talked about the force of gravity or the weight. Uh, that is the force of the, the earth pulling down on an object and it's always going to be directed down towards the center of the earth. If you want to draw the normal force on an object, that's a force that's due to contact with a surface. And it's always going to be perpendicular or at a 90 degree angle to the surface. And so if it's not resting on a table or something that's flat, that it would be directed upward. If it's on an incline, like in this picture, it's going to be at a 90 degree angle to that incline. Friction always acts in the direction that's opposite of an object's motion. So in this case, if the object is moving to the left, friction will be pushing on it to the right. Um, if it's you know moving to the right, friction would act to the left. And tension usually has to do with a string pulling on an object. And it's always when you draw a tension force, you would draw it acting you know, directed away from the object along whatever string is attached to it. You can also see in these pictures there's some ways of labeling forces with a little subscript, small f for friction, big T for tension, we had G for gravity, and N for normal force. Alright, so here's a little question for you to think about. If you are at the grocery store and you push on a cart and it's moving in a straight line at a constant speed, think about whether the force of your push is greater than friction, less than friction, or equal to friction. So think about that. Pick one of those that you think makes most sense to you. Alright, and when I do this in class sometimes I get quite a few people saying that you have to push with a force that's greater than friction, but um, that isn't true in this case. So you, the forces are balanced or equal. So since the cart isn't speeding up or slowing down or changing the direction of its motion, there's no acceleration. So from Newton's second law, there can be no net force. The forces have to be balanced to each other. So whatever force you're pushing on it with has to be balanced by friction. They have to be equal to each other to maintain a constant speed. So these, these were the key words here, constant speed. This is a really tough concept. Um, but if we wanted to draw a diagram of the forces that were acting on that cart, there's a couple different ways we could draw it, but from what we just talked about in terms of different kinds of forces, um, you would draw the force of gravity pulling down on that object, maybe the normal force from the surface acting on the wheels, and the way I drew it here was on two of the wheels. You could just draw a single normal force as well, but I made them um, together add up to the same size as this arrow because the cart isn't moving or changing its motion in the vertical direction. The force of your push is acting in that direction and then friction is acting on both of the wheels. We can also draw it as what we call a free body diagram. So if we added up all of the friction going to the left, the force of your push and the normal force up and the force of gravity down, you, could, you would see that all of them are balanced with each other so the, the cart is moving at a constant speed. It has no acceleration in either the horizontal or vertical direction. Alright, so in your workbook there's a bunch of practice questions that you'll also be looking at in your groups and will be asked to present some for the class. Um, so make sure that you have a good understanding of Newton's laws and let me know if you have any questions.